Today's scripture comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child and destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of, Jesus, out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. After doing a baptism of your granddaughter, it's always good to have an uplifting scripture like that to <laughs> have it available. It is a joy to be able to be here and to share with you. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to have this time to speak and to, again, baptize my granddaughter. Charlie, we call her, but uh, really appreciate that. A great joy. As we begin this uh, new year, anybody here make any New Year's resolutions? Anybody, anybody do that? Is that something? All right couple. Yeah. Doesn't you much good to do them when you break them pretty quick, right, anyway, so that's, uh, that's one thing. I made a New Year's resolution that I wasn't going to irritate my family anymore. <laughs> and um, that did fine Monday, but by Tuesday I'd already blown it, so it, it, it's already gone. Anyone here um, have any plans to do some traveling? Anybody like to travel? A few people like to travel. You know, if you make the plans to travel and they're your plans, that's a great thing. But if you have to travel because someone else is making you or some other situation is causing that to happen, then that gets a little more difficult. If it's forced, it's not so good. I don't think that Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus really planned on going to Egypt. Especially when you hear that they're told that they have to do this in a dream, and they leave in the middle of the night. That's not exactly travel time to be leaving. They were being forced to leave and to go somewhere else. To go because if they stayed there, Herod was going to kill their young child. We all find times when there is no peace. We all have times in our lives when things are not the way we want them to be. And even reading stories out of the Scripture, there are times when we read from the Scripture and we say, well, that doesn't sound like a great story. That's not exactly a good time. That's not exactly having everything go the way we want it to go. And we have to remind ourselves that the Bible 
is a book written about faith by people of faith for people of faith. And it's a story of faith. It's not about everything being exactly the way you wanted it to be. We forget that sometimes. For Mary and Joseph and what they knew about Herod the Great, I'm sure that they realized that this threat that he might kill their children, their child, was something to take seriously. He had already killed a couple of his sons. He had killed members of his family. He killed anyone who was seen as being any kind of threat to him and him keeping power there in that region of the world. So you knew that he was going to be able to do that. And when you hear the idea that he's going to come and kill, then they take it seriously and they travel to Egypt. And he does come there. Now I'm also sure that Joseph and Mary probably didn't find out about him coming, Herod the Great, coming and killing these children in the town of Bethlehem until later on. But I imagine that didn't give them any peace. I imagine that was not a, something that they wanted to have happen. It's been estimated that there were perhaps 21 children that were killed in this little town of Bethlehem by Herod the Great in this slaughter of the innocents, as it's called. There's no peace in that. No peace when we hear those stories about those things happening, and I'm sure there was no peace for Joseph and Mary. Peace is defined as freedom from disturbance. And that was probably very disturbing to hear that story. But we all have times of disturbance, don't we? We all have times when there is no peace for us as well. In our history, you don't have to look too far looking at the Holocaust and the destruction of six million Jews during World War II and the terrible things that occurred there. When we hear that, there's no peace in that. No peace for anyone. We were at the uh, museum in Loveland this past week and they had an exhibit by Ansel Adams that was showing him when he went to a relocation camp in Nevada, California border along those, those lines, and showing pictures of Japanese first generation that were forced to leave everything that they had in California and the West Coast, leave everything behind and travel to these relocation camps. As we watch those pictures of those Japanese, U.S. citizen Japanese, being forced to go into relocation camps, which I, I didn't realize started in March of 42, but it was voluntary. Shortly it became mandatory that they leave and go to these camps. As you see the faces on these Japanese Americans, you can see there is no peace. And there's no peace for me as I watch that and remind myself <coughs> excuse me, of some of the atrocities that go on in the world around us. <coughs> the floods of 2013 are very close to here. As we think about those and the destruction and the loss of life, there's no peace in that either. As we think about COVID and what's occurred with that, there's a time of no peace as well. Many, many things we can think of in our world around us. Things that are going on even now. The destruction of and the killing of Jewish people by the Hamas. Senseless, horrible killings <coughs> that was taking place. And some of the response with over 20,000 people that have been killed since then. There's no peace as a part of that. We all seek peace and want peace in our life. 
We need peace in our life. And with that peace, we also then can find hope. Hope is defined as feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. When we have trouble with peace, I think people are looking for water for me, and I got it right here, so. (laughs) They just left. Thanks, though. When we look for peace, it helps us find hope. If there is no peace, it becomes difficult to find hope in the world around us. We need to have peace. But too often we look for it in other things. Too many times I think we look for peace to to be a time when we'll have enough security that we can find peace. And yet, do we ever have a time when there's enough security? When we have enough money to be able to do whatever it is we want, but do we ever have enough money for that to occur? Do we ever have enough power to really find the kind of peace where we have everything going our way? Do you ever have a time when there's enough love and grace and acceptance where we don't have any disturbances? We can be looking for that kind of peace where everything is going fine and we have no problems and everything fits together and it all fits together in a nice little neat container and everything is just great. But life isn't that way, is it? Life is not a series of great, great things that go on with never having any kind of disturbance. Life is filled with challenges and things that occur to us that are always going to bring about difficulties. I believe this story of Jesus and his family can give us a peace that we need so that we can find hope. The Gospel of Matthew looked at the whole story and tries to see everything that's going on with this story of of Jesus and his parents leaving and then traveling back to go to Nazareth. He looks at the whole story as a sign of God's presence and power in our lives. Too often, I think, when we think about peace, we think about it in terms of our own life of security and presence and good things occurring. When the real peace is made and found in the presence of a God who was there with us all the time. In the presence of a God who was loving us and caring for us unconditionally. (coughs) In the presence of a God who was fulfilling Scripture. who is fulfilling the promises that God has made to us, that he will be with us and guide us and love us. Not just in the good times, but in the most difficult times as well. It's when we can find that kind of peace that we can begin to understand and have a chance to have hope. In those situations in the world today where there is no peace, they're looking for hope. (coughs) But they have to find peace first. (coughs) Excuse me. This whole sad and difficult story of Mary and Joseph having to go south to Egypt and back (coughs) is a story that's about the peace that God offers and the hope that comes from God's love. It's a peace that God wants all of us to have. But it's a peace that's found not in the inner little tiny things of life and the good or bad things that occur. It's found 
in the presence of a God who has been willing to become flesh and blood in the form of Jesus the Christ <coughs> and to live and dwell among us. To show us what it was about to love, what it was about to care, what it was about to share life, what it was about to be humble. To show us how to live by becoming flesh and blood. Christianity is the only faith that has God loving us enough to become flesh and blood to show us how to do it. And that's what we celebrate in this great gift. And that's what gives us peace. And as that gives us peace, it gives us hope. It's not found in security. It's not found in intelligence. It's not found in money or country or war or destruction. It's found in the presence of God loving us unconditionally. Because I think that in all the world, of all the powers that there are in the world, there is no power in the world greater than the power of one person reaching out and loving another person. No power greater than that. And that is the great gift that God has given to us in Jesus the Christ. And that is the great gift that all of us have been given because God loves us that much. Let us pray. O Lord God, fill us with your spirit and love. Guide us and direct us to be open to your presence that we may know your grace and your love are there and be guided by that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.